Hello my friends, welcome to my Energy Economist channel. In this video, we're gonna talk about the primary production. Stay with me. Petroleum occurs in the microscopic pores of sedimentary rocks that form a reservoir typically. Reservoir rock consists of sand, sandstone, limestone, or dolomite. However, not all of the pores in a rock will contain petroleum. Some will be filled with water or brine that is saturated with minerals. Both oil and gas have a low specific gravity relative to water and will thus float through the more porous sections of reservoir rock from their source area to the surface unless restrained by a trap. A trap is a reservoir that is overlain and underlain by dense impermeable cap rock, or a zone of very low or no porosity that restrains migrating hydrocarbon. Reservoirs vary from being quite small to covering several thousands of acres, and range in thickness from a few inches to hundreds of feet or more. In general, petroleum is extracted by drilling wells from an appropriate surface configuration in the hydrocarbon peering reservoir. Wells are designed to contain and to control all fluid flow at all times throughout drilling and reducing operations. The number of wells required is dependent on a combination of technical and economic factors used to determine the most likely range of recoverable reserves relative to a range of potential investment alternatives. There are three phases for recovering oil from reservoirs. One, primary recovery occurs as wells produce because of natural energy from expansion of gas and water within the producing formation, pushing fluids in the well bore and lifting the fluids to the surface. Second, second recovery requires energy to be applied to lift the fluids to surface. This may be accomplished by injecting gas down a hole to lift the fluids to the surface. An installation of a subsurface pump or injection gas or water into the formation itself. Tertiary recovery occurs when a means is required to increase fluid mobility within the reservoir this may be accomplished by introducing additional heat in the formation to lower the viscosity and improve its ability to flow to the well pore. Production rates from reservoirs depend on a number of factors, such as reservoir geometry, reservoir pressure, reservoir depth, rock type and permeability, fluid saturations and properties, extent of fracturing, number of wells and their locations and the ratio of the permeability of the formation to the viscosity of the oil. The geological variability of reservoirs means that production profiles differ from field to field. Heavy oil reservoirs can be developed to significant levels of production and maintained for a period of time by supplementing natural dry force, while gas reservoirs normally decline more rapidly. The primary production from a reservoir when the driving force is the expansion of oil plus the solution gas will depend on the pressure being above or below the bubble point. As long as reservoir pressure is above the bubble point, only oil is produced and the solution factor of gas in the produced oil remains constant. When the pressure falls below the bubble point, the liberated gas may be produced in the wells together with the oil, and the produced gas to oil ratio starts to increase. After some time, the driving force is exhausted and the production curve starts to fall. At the same time, water production may start, which is unfavorable. The total recovery for such reservoirs is small, 5 to 25%. Preferentially, 
the gas should have remained in the reservoir to maintain the driving force. This can to some extent be achieved by a well strategy, which allows the liberated gas to migrate away from the production wells to the top of the reservoir. In medieval days, oil was collected from seepages and even hand dug wells. But before the 19th century had closed, drilling technology, which had already been developed for salt extraction, was adopted to the oil industry. The cable tool consisting of no more than a pulley shaped weight on the end of a rope which stumbled its way in the earth was followed by the more efficient rotary rig comprising a bit on the end of a rotating shaft allowing the search to go deeper. Great technological progress was made in all aspects of separation while much early exploration was undertaken by the so-called wild cutters. It didn't take long to discover the essential geological controls of source, reservoir, trap, and seal. At first, petroleum geologists relied on surface observations to identify promising prospects. Endowed with the rare, right combination of circumstances, but before long they developed geophysical techniques to scan the depths, both the technology and the interpretation become ever more sophisticated. Assisted in more recent years by massive computing power, perhaps the most important development of all was a geochemical breakthrough in the 1980s, which elucidated the conditions for oil generation itself, making it possible to map accurately where oil was formed and where it wasn't. In technological terms, a major development was a semi-submersible rig mounted on relatively stable pontons beneath the wave base which opened up the continental shelves of the world to exploration bringing in new production to replace the traditional onshore fields that were depleting even more elaborate floating production facilities later tapped the few deep water areas having the necessary geological conditions to yield oil. The technical achievements of installing wellheads on the seabed and developing floating production facilities have been truly impressive. The operations are constrained by the limit of the floating facilities, giving a plateau rather than a peak of production. Only large fields are commercially viable, given the high operating costs. Secondary recovery techniques such as water injection are also constrained in the circumstances. It's even more difficult and expensive to produce deep water gas. Deep water operations test technology to the limit and there have been occasional accidents, including the serious Macondo accident in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010, when 11 men lost their lives and widespread pollution had a serious economic and environmental impact on the U.S. coastline. The move to the deep water heralded another wave of optimism, as economists looking at their office atlas concluded that there were vast oceans about to deliver a limitless new supply of oil. But again, the geological constraints began to manifest themselves. The deep water finds of South America, Africa, and in the Gulf of Mexico rely on oil generated in the rifts that opened as the continents began to move apart 150 million years ago. At first, the rifts were filled with fresh water to become lakes, resembling those of East Africa today, but then the sea broke in. It was subject to a high level of evaporation under the warm climate of the time, which led to the deposition of a thick layer of salt which sealed the underlying oil. Later, about 60 million years ago, sands and clays which had been deposited at the mouth of rivers on the adjoining continents slammed down the continental slope. In some areas, they were then taken back in the suspension by ocean currents, which winnowed out the fine-grained material depositing beds of porous sand on the ocean floor. 
Still later, structural movements locally ruptured the salt seal to allow the oil to migrate upwards and collect the boats of sandstone, which formed excellent reservoirs for oil. The remarkable combination of circumstances is obvious. Successful attempts are now being made to penetrate the salt seal itself and find what is left beneath it, with some promising results in Brazil, albeit at a depth of about 5,000 meters. If you want to learn more about their primary production, you could do so in my book, Economic Study of Oil and Gas While Drilling, which is published on Amazon. Check it out at the link in the description. Please take a second to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and don't forget to also hit the notification bell. Thank you for watching and goodbye.